Well, hello, students. This is Professor Shalomo Levy, and I'm here with you today, virtually at Northampton Community College, in an effort to walk you through my presentation on the age of Jackson. Of course, a lot of this material is covered in the assigned chapters, and uh, there is a PowerPoint version of this uh, in Blackboard. But I'm hoping uh, that by narrating uh, this material, it may make it clearer uh, for students. Uh, these presentations uh, were originally created for me uh, to use in the classroom with students. They remind me of what I want to talk about next and make note taking easier for students. But sometimes I suspect that a student looks at a slide and wonders uh, what are we supposed to get out of that slide? What um, is the significance or importance of that? And so these visual prompts for me, when I look at them, remind me of what I want to talk about and I know exactly what I want to say or story that I want to tell that goes along with the slide. So hopefully uh, this presentation will give some insight, some analysis uh, that might not otherwise uh, be clear from just reading the text or just looking at the slides alone. Uh, also, I'm recording this for students who prefer uh, to learn in an environment uh, such as a classroom where there's a live professor there who could explain material for them. Uh, this presentation isn't going to be as long as an actual class lesson, um, but it's going to be a brief summary, a synopsis, uh, particularly of certain points that I think are significant. I hope uh, that these explanations and this analysis uh, makes it easier for you to learn and understand the material. And I invite you um, to uh, write to me, to come visit me during office hours when we have them, and to share your ideas with your classmates in our online uh, Blackboard discussion of this material. Okay, so with that, let's uh, get right into it. Uh, today we're focusing on Andrew Jackson, uh, our seventh president, and one of the most influential of all of American presidents. Uh, there's a whole era in history named after him called the Age of Jackson. And so what we're going to take a deeper dive in today is what happened during his political career uh, that so shaped uh, American history. Here we see different views that people still have about Andrew Jackson to this day. Um, some see him as the champion of the common man. Indeed, he was the founder of the modern Democratic Party. Um, and so people think of him as the people's president. And so that's why he's partly on the $20 bill. His opponents and his critics today uh, see him as a kind of autocratic, uh, monarchical, um, uh, leader, uh, and he was dubbed King Andrew uh, by his opponents. This is also why the opposition party, which came to be known as the Whig Party, uh, later it will go through various formations in 1854, uh, become the modern Republican Party. I don't want to draw too much of a straight line between the Whig Party and, and the Republican Party, but uh, we have always been largely a two-party system which distinguishes America from other uh, modern democracies that have multi-party systems. Um, but America uh, tended to be a two-party system. Uh, we learned that the Founding Fathers originally did not intend for us to have parties at all. Uh, this is what they call in the Federalist Papers factions, and they thought that they could be very divisive. And indeed, to a certain extent, they have been. Um, but those parties began to form right uh, in Washington's administration. Uh, we saw that between the early Federalist um, and then with Thomas Jefferson, Democratic Republican Party. Um, and so um, from 1800 um, for basically the next 20 years, the Democratic Republican Party dominated American politics. The Federalist Party uh, became defunct because they couldn't win any elections um, until this time of, of Andrew Jackson. So um, he really stirred things up and politics really began to change because of that. It took a form that we recognize today. Uh, many of the ways in which politics occurs today where candidates run for office um, as you see in this slide here, um, he is even referred to as being on the campaign trail. 
or the campaign stump. And this actually referred to, you know, uh, politicians uh, going to towns and standing in the public square, maybe under a tree or on the stump of literally the stump of a tree, which is where the term stumping comes from or standing on a ladder. Later, these would become stages and platforms and now, you know, television. Uh, but it refers to the act of politicians going out in the public and campaigning or asking people, voters, to vote for them. This is relatively new. Uh, many of the early founding fathers uh, would have disapproved of this. For instance, George Washington wanted to be asked to become president. Um, he didn't want to appear too ambitious or desirous of public office. In fact, they were suspicious that people who wanted uh, public office too eagerly uh, were doing so out of vanity because of their egos for fame, possibly for fortune. And so that was kind of frowned upon um, in the early years of the Republic. But by this point, by the 1820s and 30s, uh, we see the roots of early American politics where politicians go out and ask the voters to support them, uh, laying out their ideas, criticizing their opponents. Uh, all of this was really heating up during the age of Jackson. It's also a time in which there's a vast increase in democratic participation in the United States. So although uh, we think of America as a democracy, and indeed it is the world's longest running democracy, the Greeks had an experiment with democracy that didn't last very long, the Romans tried a democracy that didn't last very long. Um, so America um, has had uh, the longest lasting uh, democratic system of government uh, in the Western world, and um, it has continued to become more democratic as time moved on. Uh, here, uh, during this Jacksonian period, we see an increase in uh, voter participation, mainly as a result of many states dropping their original property requirements. That is, um, after the Constitution was drafted, most states had some property or wealth requirement that an individual had to have in order to be able to vote in an election. By the 1830s, uh, all states had dropped their property requirements. What that meant, as I have here in the slide, is that white male suffrage increased. So that the only requirements uh, by the 1830s were that you be white and a male and basically all white men uh, were allowed uh, to vote. As an interesting note, um, before this, even in the late 1780s, um, some African American men were voting in certain states like New York and Massachusetts. Even women were allowed to vote briefly uh, in the state of New Jersey. Um, so, but for white men in particular, uh, they achieved universal white male suffrage. And uh, voting uh, increased dramatically. You would see uh, voting levels as, uh, as high as 80% almost of eligible white male voters during this period compared to, you know, voter turnout today of, I mean, we would be happy today if we got 50% voter participation. And among young people, among uh, people of minority groups, uh, voter participation is even lower. And so you may discuss in uh, Blackboard uh, this week, uh, why is it that f so few Americans uh, participate uh, in democratic processes by voting um, today as compared to the period we're studying? Another thing, uh, the partisanship. And this comes along with party identity, um, I think, to, to a large extent. Uh, but it uh, reached a new height during the Jacksonian period. He really uh, uh, made the distinctions between uh, the Democrats uh, that he represented and members of other opposing parties. And so the spoil system, this is uh, the an item that needs some explanation perhaps uh, on the slide there, because when it says spoil, uh, I don't want you to think of like spoiled milk or something or spoiled uh, in any other connotation of just being um, privileged or, uh, you know, 
Uh, but in this sense, the spoils system is actually a military term. Um, it comes from, and Andrew Jackson was a general, uh, military background, um, a hero of the War of 1812. Um, and so the term spoils um, comes from the military expression, to the victor belongs the spoils, meaning the spoils of war, the, the rewards, the booty, um, uh, the things that come with victory. And so they started to regard politics as war. And one party is at war against the other party. And the party that wins um, deserves the spoils of war. And what are those spoils? Uh, all the positions in government. To appoint people who supported you in the previous election, who supported your party, um, and give those loyalist positions within the government. And so from this time on, uh, politicians of one party or another if uh, they take control of government from the previous party, they would often fire uh, all the federally appointed officials at high levels of the previous party and replace them with uh, people loyal to their own party. And that's called the spoil system. And Andrew Jackson uh, didn't create it, but he really raised it uh, to a new level. And finally, uh, on this slide, the the aspects of campaigning that we recognize today, of holding rallies, of parades, floats, uh, endorsements, um, uh, all of these uh, aspects of modern campaigning uh, started to be instituted uh, during this period. This slide um, shows a rendition of Andrew Jackson's humble upbringing, that is being born in a log cabin. This became a point of pride eventually for Andrew Jackson, that he, unlike many of the early founding fathers, he was not born rich. He did not come from a wealthy background. He did not um, uh, get a formal education. And uh, he kind of reveled in that, himself from being a man of the people. And uh, and so presents uh, that uh, Westerner um, border identity throughout his presidency, even after he became a very wealthy landowner, slave owner himself, um, he still kind of relished in those humble upbringings. As uh, I think we studied briefly last week when we were closing out this era of the first seven presidents, um, Jackson's first foray into politics was unsuccessful. He ran in 1824 um, for, uh, uh, to become the nominee for uh, the Democratic Republican Party. And um, in that election, as you recall, he was up against Henry Clay, Speaker of the House in Kentucky, John Quincy Adams, who was Secretary of State, um, William Crawford. And um, in that election, uh, as you can see on the slide here, uh, Andrew Jackson received more electoral votes than any other candidate in the race, and he also received a higher percentage of the popular vote than any other candidate. Yet, he did not become president in 1824, and I hope you're able to know why he did not become president, even though he received more electoral votes and more popular votes. This is an important question, probably be on the next exam. Um, but the reason for that is that the 12th Amendment required that the winner receive a majority of the popular, of the, of the electoral votes. Uh, popular votes don't actually count, um, and, but then we'll see also during this period um, that uh, many states will then use the popular vote as a way to allocate their electoral votes. So it does matter, uh, and it's important that people do vote for that reason. But in this election, um, he did not have a majority that is more than 50%. And so what happens in that case, if no candidate gets more than 50%, then the House of Representatives gets to choose the next president. And that's exactly what happened uh, in 1824. And in that negotiation bargaining, they chose to select John Quincy Adams to be the sixth president of the United States. And Andrew Jackson and his supporters uh, referred to that as the corrupt bargain. 
that, that they were robbed. We should have become president. More people wanted us, more people voted for us um, than any of our opponents, but um, the politicians in Washington uh, selected the blue blood, John Quincy Adams, of course, being the son of John Adams, our second president. And so, uh, so Andrew Jackson did feel a kind of class bias that they preferred the blue blood Bostonian um, over, uh, you know, uh, over someone of humble birth like Andrew Jackson. And so he really played up these class uh, divisions and these regional uh, divisions uh, as well. Um, and this uh, marred, unfortunately, uh, John Quincy Adams' presidency was always under that taint of corruption, especially after he named Henry Clay his Secretary of State. And so you notice a pattern here in these early presidents that the route to the White House came uh, as often from being Secretary of State as a way or the route to becoming president rather than becoming vice president. Uh, most of our vice presidents from, from John Adams on uh, thought of the vice presidency as a do-nothing job, a job that you're just there in case something happens to the president. But in the meantime, uh, you don't have much authority, you don't have much responsibility, um, and so, um, so they would rather uh, be in a position of power like Secretary of State, where you're largely in charge of foreign policy. Um, and so when John Quincy Adams then named Henry Clay to be his Secretary of State, the way it was viewed at the time is that John Quincy Adams was repaying a debt that he owed to Henry Clay for making him president uh, because he was Speaker of the House and, and rallied those votes in John Quincy Adams' favor. And then also he was set Henry Clay up to become the next president by making him Secretary of State. Uh, that didn't happen, but that was the suspicion uh, or um, the fear. The next great crisis um, that would occur, before I talk about the rematch, the election of 1828, uh, four years later, uh, I don't want to completely overlook John Quincy Adams as our sixth president. He was a one-term president. So he, he was appointed uh, by the House of Representatives and fell miserably in a in a you know one on one matchup against Andrew Jackson four years later, but um, I think uh, John Quincy Adams was an interesting uh, person. Um, on paper, uh, he looks like he could have been and perhaps should have been the one of the most qualified people to become president. Um, he was a congressman. He had served as a United States Senator, he had been a United States Ambassador, and he had served as Secretary of State. Um, he was highly educated, Harvard uh, graduate, um, uh, and even though his father was John Quincy Adams, uh, he was you know, hardworking, very intelligent, graduating at the top of his class. Um, and un under President Monroe, when he was Secretary of State, he is the one who really crafted what became known as the Monroe Doctrine. So we give credit to President Monroe, but the Secretary of State was uh, John Quincy Adams. So he was a very capable uh, leader in both foreign and domestic policy. Uh, he had embraced uh, the ideals of the Democratic Republican Party, even though his father, John Quincy Adams, was a staunch Federalist. Um, uh, and some of his goals, which he didn't achieve, was uh, but one that interests me is his this idea of creating a national university, um, and so many of the founding father early founding fathers were very committed to public education, and uh, we saw Benjamin Franklin, whose autobiography you finished recently, um, later becomes the founder of the Pennsylvania Philosophical Society and then the University of Pennsylvania. Thomas Jefferson, after his presidency. Uh, goes back to Virginia and becomes the founder and president of the University of Virginia. And John Quincy Adams uh, wanted to start a kind of um, uh, national university. Today we do have American University, um, but it's, it's a private college. Um, but this idea of, 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 of public education uh, on the college level, uh, that was one of John Quincy Adams' 
uh, one of his goals. Um, he never was able to realize it and didn't become a reality, but I think uh, it was important and significant nonetheless. Um, when we look at uh, the rematch, we have the election results there. Um, it, it wasn't close at all. I mean, it was a total blowout. Um, uh, this time, uh, the Democratic Party, the Jacksonian supporters were organized. They were highly enthusiastic. They turned out in large numbers, and it was a landslide victory for Andrew Jackson. He got much more than 50% of the electoral votes. They could not deny him uh, the presidency and a majority of the popular vote as well. So he was a very popular president. Uh, and many um, polls and public opinion, he was more popular than Thomas Jefferson. And so the most popular presidents were George Washington, of course, and um, Andrew Jackson, and then later uh, Abraham Lincoln. Um, Andrew Jackson's popularity has plummeted in recent years um, to the point now that people want to remove him from the $20 bill, and he was supposed to be replaced um, at the end of the Obama administration with Harriet Tubman. That hasn't happened yet at the time of this recording. But his popularity has become um, marred, and uh, his history and record has been uh, kind of critiqued in a new light. But that's what we see here. But uh, he won um, uh, the presidency of 1828, and he comes into office, and um, his first major challenge in office is the tariff battles. Uh, and that's what this uh, slide shows. And here what I want to explain to students to today uh, what this fight was all about. Um, tariffs in the 19th century were the primary means by which the federal government raised revenue. That is, there was no income tax. Um, there were several excise taxes, that is taxes on goods and products, um, such as Washington instituting the whiskey tax, which they then reduced. But most of the revenue came from tariffs. Tariffs are fees or taxes, but fees that are placed on imported goods. When companies bring products that were made in foreign countries into the United States, in the 19th century, they had to pay a tariff or duty on that product. This did two things. One, it generated revenue for the federal government, <clears throat> which was a good thing. But it also um, made goods that Americans produced and exported abroad more expensive because typically what countries do is if you place a tariff on goods that they import into your country, they will retaliate by placing a tariff on things that your country imports into their country. So the main products that America exported were, pausing to see if you know, were tobacco and cotton. Uh, so those were America's biggest exports in the 19th century, and both of those things were produced in the South by slaves. And so the South was particularly hard hit by these tariffs that foreign countries would impose on American products in response to our tariffs on their products. It also exacerbated regional tensions between North and South because since the tariffs made foreign goods more expensive, it thereby protected American businesses and American industry from foreign competition. So goods produced in America would generally be cheaper than those same goods produced in foreign countries. And so this is a very pro-business, pro-Northern industry um, economic program that favored American businesses, Northern businesses and industry, American factories, um, but it had the potential of hurting American agricultural products. So you see the beginnings of North-South um, tension over this issue. Okay, uh, let's skip along. Uh, I'm skipping a couple of slides, which I don't think need explanation, and going to the next crisis in the Jackson administration, and that was the nullification issue. 
The nullification crisis really grew out of the tariff conflict uh, because it put states in the position of what are they going to do about these tariffs. And leaders of southern states, like John C. Calhoun, were floating the idea that they can just simply nullify federal laws that they don't agree with. So if southern states don't believe in these tariffs uh, that have been passed by Congress, that they can simply nullify that or any law that they don't like. And so this raised a constitutional and federal uh, crisis over uh, whether nullification was possible or legal under our Constitution. And uh, Senator Daniel Webster of Massachusetts uh, became one of uh, the leading statesmen um, during uh, this period, uh, really arguing particularly uh, with Robert Hayne and uh, John C. Calhoun um, <clears throat> that in our federal structure and our Republican nature of government that um, that federal law was supreme. States had to obey uh, these laws. And as he said, liberty and union now and forever one and inseparable. Now that word um, inseparable uh, meaning <clears throat> that you could not uh, either nullify a federal law or secede, uh, leave the union if you didn't agree with something. This is a harbinger of things to come, uh, of the Civil War. When we get to the Civil War period, uh, in a few weeks again, you'll hear theories of nullification and separation and secession. And that had come up uh, during the Jackson administration and uh, I think perhaps to Jackson's enduring credit, uh, how he averted or uh, handled this nullification uh, crisis um, that grew out of um, uh, the tariff um, conflict. And this is how Jackson uh, did it. Although he was a Southerner himself um, and a planter and a slave owner, as I mentioned earlier, um, he did believe in federal authority and in the importance of obeying the federal government. And so when people, particularly like um, Henry Clay, excuse me, but, uh, so it's um, somewhat ironic that his vice president was, okay, so as I was saying about this nullification crisis, um, it's somewhat ironic that Andrew Jackson chose as his vice president, John Quincy Adams, excuse me, kind of edit that part out, uh, it is somewhat ironic it is somewhat ironic that President Andrew Jackson chose John C. Calhoun, a senator from South Carolina, uh, a firebrand, uh, to be his vice president because John C. Calhoun was one of these leaders of the whole theory of nullification. And Andrew Jackson opposed that. And uh, here's an interesting story um, that at a dinner in honor of Thomas Jefferson, uh, Andrew Jackson is there uh, as president and he rises from his table and he clicks his glass and he says, I like to make a toast. And he raises his glass and he says, you know, to our union, um, most dear. And everyone uh, applauds and drinks their champagne. And then uh, John C. Calhoun rises to offer a counter toast. Uh, and basically in that toast, he says, uh, the union next to our liberty is most dear, uh, implying that states' rights comes first over federal rights. Um, and this tension, um, really even between the president and vice president, caused John C. Calhoun to actually resign as vice president over this issue. Jackson famously, as I have here in, the, in this slide, threatened, as he said, to, quote, hang every traitor from a sour apple tree. So anybody even talks about, thinks about seceding from the United States, uh, he will bring his army to South Carolina or anywhere uh, in the South uh, where they're talking about secession or nullification, and he will hang all the traitors. 
And this is typical Andrew Jackson. Uh, it's also a threat that people took seriously because he was uh, a general. He actually, even his president, still often preferred to be called General Jackson and reminding people of that. Um, he had brought his army down into Florida, uh, chasing Seminole Indians, which helped us get Florida as a state during the adams Oneidas, uh Treaty. And um, as an Indian fighter, um, and um, and as a person who had engaged in several duels, he actually killed a man in a duel, and he threatened would often threaten people um, to challenge them to a duel or to beat them with his cane. And so when Andrew Jackson said, you know, I'll bring the army down there and I'll start hanging people, people took that seriously. And so ultimately, you know, a, a compromise was reached. The level of the tariffs was brought down significantly um, and a crisis was averted um, during uh, this period. Um, this is one of Jackson's kind of more favorable moments. Uh, and people wonder, well, what if he had been president uh, in the 1850s? So comparing him to someone like uh, President James Buchanan, the only president from Pennsylvania. And in the years leading up to the Civil War, states are leaving, again, starting with South Carolina. And President Buchanan seems incapable of doing anything about secession. Instead, he leaves it to Abraham Lincoln to deal with when he comes into office. Whereas um, Jackson's decisiveness, that Andrew Jackson would have taken the army down there and he would have kept the southern states in line. Um, again, somewhat different because Andrew Jackson was a southerner himself, so the north-south tension wasn't as acute. Uh, he was a slave owner, and so it's not that he hated the South, and they understood that, uh, but he uh, demanded um, obedience um, to the federal government in that regard. His next crisis, and the one for which he is most criticized today, has to do with the Native American policy, uh, more specifically, the Indian removal policy. And um, this was a law passed by Congress in 1830 called the Indian Removal Act. And what it uh, did was to force five Native American tribal groups off of their ancestral land and uh, forcibly relocated them west of the Mississippi River, a place that would be called in Oklahoma today, uh, but to march them uh, thousands of miles away to, um, to um, resettle them so that that land in the southern part and central part of the United States could be taken over by white settlers, um, essentially is, is, is um, what the policy accomplished. And it was very controversial uh, at the time. The Cherokee Nation uh, sued in federal court, first in a case called Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, which is talked about uh, in the textbook. And I want to correct something I think that was in the earliest slide and in some textbooks, but uh, the Cherokee Nation versus Georgia case of 1831 is important, but they did not, the Cherokees did not win that lawsuit. Uh, it was settled on technical grounds where Chief Justice John Marshall at that time said um, that they couldn't resolve the matter because uh, of standing, whether the Cherokee Nation was an independent country or not. And uh, they ruled in that case that the Indian nations were wards of the American government. Um, that they, and so therefore they couldn't, couldn't sue as independent countries. Well, in the Worcester versus Georgia case a year later, 1832, the Supreme Court then in that decision ruled in favor of the Cherokee Nation and said that they are indeed a, a nation. They have engaged in treaties with the United States, um, in this case going back hundreds of years from the arrival of the English settlers to the, to the present, where uh, they had signed treaties uh, saying we live here and the English Americans live there. And so therefore the state of Georgia could not uh, pass laws 
affecting Cherokee Nation uh, land and and their uh, and their uh, tribal tribal lands. Let me restate that. What the Worcester versus Georgia decision did is it established that the Cherokee Nation and therefore all the other Native American nations um, were independent entities, that they were countries, essentially. Uh, countries within the United States, but they had legal rights as countries, and therefore the state of Georgia could not forcibly take their land. Um, so that they were sovereign to a certain extent nations and not citizens of the state of Georgia. And uh, this gave them a certain amount of, of legal protection um, from from states that wanted to encroach upon their land. Now, it's significant in terms of how Andrew Jackson reacted to that. And I have that quote on the screen where Andrew Jackson said, John Marshall, who's the chief justice of the Supreme Court, John Marshall has made his decision. Now let him enforce it. And what that meant that I want you to understand is that in our system of government, we have three branches of government. The executive branch, which is the president, the legislative branch makes the laws. The Supreme Court interprets the rules on the laws. But the president, the executive branch, is supposed to enforce the laws. That's why the president is also commander in chief of the armed forces. That's why the Justice Department is in the executive branch, so that through, uh, through um, the FBI, through the military, the federal government could enforce uh, the laws that Congress has passed and the decisions that the Supreme Court has ruled upon. In this case, when Andrew Jackson says John Marshall has made his decision, let's see him enforce it, this is saying, I'm not going to do anything to see that that decision is enforced. And without the enforcement mechanism of the executive branch, then the Supreme Court's words are meaningless uh, because he has no no army, no police force um, to see that those decisions of respecting the rights of the Cherokee Nation are going to be protected unless the president uses his power. And this is actually the oath of office. When the president uh, is sworn in, he puts his hand on the Bible, and the oath says that I will uh, see that the laws of this country are faithfully executed. So that's his job. Uh, to see that the laws are faithfully executed. But in this case, Andrew Jackson said, I'm not going to lift a finger um, to see that these laws are executed. Uh, as a matter of fact, not only would he, would he not uh, back up the Supreme Court, he would actively, um, what, what Andrew Jackson said is, I'm going to move those Indians. I don't care what the Supreme Court says, those Indians are going to be moved. And so I asked the discussion question in class and for uh, you to discuss online, what should have or could have happened if a president disobeys the Supreme Court? Well, the options obviously are impeachment, um, that this could have been viewed as an impeachable offense, um, or the public could have reacted by not electing him uh, again in 1832. So uh, either of those things could have happened, uh, neither of them did. So he was not, Andrew Jackson was not impeached, and he was reelected. <clears throat> and so what this shows is that although we have these checks and balances in our Constitution, and we studied that a few weeks ago, um, these are prerogatives that have to be exercised. So Congress has to be willing to use this power of impeachment or to use this power control of the budget, of the purse, um, to to uh, to use his powers of checks and balances and the public also in his, in his election processes. In this case, Andrew Jackson knew that what he was doing was very popular among the American people in the 19th century and that what the Supreme Court had ruled, although it may have been legally correct, was unpopular. And so he could uh, um, oppose the Supreme Court without suffering uh, any consequences during his own time. And so here you see a map of how the Indian uh, territories uh, were confiscated. Um, they were often called the five civilized tribes. I don't like that term because 
it implies that the other Indian nations are not civilized. But the reason they were called the five civilized tribes, the Chicksaw, the Choctaw, the Creeks, uh, the Cherokee, the Seminole, is that they had, uh, to a large extent, adapted to change. Um, they had uh, become farmers instead of hunter-gatherers as they had been for centuries. They were farming um, cotton and tobacco and food goods just like white southern farmers. Uh, many of them had converted to Christianity uh, because of the missionaries. Um, many of them um, spoke English. They dressed in Western clothing. Uh, they went to college. They, some of them even became slave owners. So they had very much assimilated uh, to Western culture and society. They were not hostile in terms of, but there was not like Indian attacks on on Southern towns and villages and uh, killing people. Uh, they were living relatively peaceful lives in their on their own land uh, and adapting to Western society, American society, um, in in uh, their beliefs, in their practices. Um, in their traditions, um, the problem was that they were living on land that the white settlers wanted. Uh, particularly when gold was discovered, small amounts it turned out to be a false kind of gold rush. But when they thought there was gold in North Carolina, uh, that people wanted that land. And then it was fertile agricultural land. And um, this is really what was motivating um, the desire to push them off that this would lead to uh, the Trail of Tears um, the map uh, that I have up again shows where they were forced from and where they were moved to um, in total we believe that about 46,000 Indians were removed we want to use that term Indian removal removal or or ejected or had their land uh, stolen from them. And they took about 25 million acres of ancestral land. Over 2,000 Indians died in this trek uh, that we call the Trail of Tears. So that's what the Trail of Tears uh, was about. I do have a very good documentary uh, called The Trail of Tears uh, that's linked in your Blackboard shell. There's also a link to it in the digital version of your textbook. I highly recommend uh, the students watch this documentary. Um, it's a good film, very high quality, very historically accurate, and uh, you should watch it if you have an opportunity. Jackson claimed that he loved the Native Americans um, and argued that he was doing this Indian removal in an effort to save them to protect them, that if they stay where they were, they would be subject to harassment, that they, they would lose their culture, and that by moving them uh, out of the United States, essentially, uh, they would be f free to flourish and thrive and continue their, their culture um, and their society um, without interference. And so he um, tried to justify that he was he was actually saving them, not destroying them. Of course, where they where they moved them to Oklahoma would also become part of the United States. And so again, the, America would just keep moving west uh, eventually to the 1850s when we get all the way to California and to the Pacific Ocean. So there was no place you were going to move them in the United States. This would also lead later to the system of reservations, putting them on smaller reservations. Um, but this is the tragedy of, of what happens to Native Americans, particularly under the Jackson administration. Now, I ask a thought question here for class discussion. Does Andrew Jackson get a bad rap in history? Is he blamed unfairly for his anti-Indian attitudes that were very popular at the time? So that today, to be looked back at this period uh, as a tragic moment in American history, and blame a lot of it on Andrew Jackson, as opposed to the American people and American society. Uh, what he was doing is very popular at the time. It wasn't, you know, just his view, his opinion. Um, 
and especially you know with the Cherokee people because um, during the War of 1812 the Cherokee Nation helped Andrew Jackson fight against the British particularly the epic battle the Battle of New Orleans uh, which he may not have been able to win without Indian support without the Indians the Cherokee Nation helping him uh, uh, in that in that battle, and then for him later as president now to push them off their land is a, le a level of betrayal um, that you know also mars um, Jackson's um, kind of reputation. And the final crisis uh, that I want to talk about is the bank and the charter of the bank and the veto of the bank. Hopefully, you read all of that in the textbook. If you're wondering what what that was all about, it was a power struggle to a large extent and it came to a head between President Andrew Jackson and the president and manager of the Bank of the United States a man by the name of Nicholas Biddle and this conflict was as much about personalities and egos as it was about policy um, Andrew Jackson's reaction was was largely emotional rather than based on an, any um, real economic sense. And I know this kind of harsh, but uh, um, Andrew Jackson, as a land speculator and as a planter, was always suspicious of banks in general, of being in debt to banks. And he always saw them as being uh, largely northern, um, just like we saw with Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton, these kind of northern bankers, um, which is that regional tension there. Also, uh, he was suspicious of paper money, that uh, banks would often issue bank notes and bonds and uh, things like that. And Andrew Jackson believed in what was called species, that is, you should use gold and silver coins and was suspicious of banks and suspicious of paper money. Um, and uh, Nicholas Biddle from Massachusetts represented that kind of northern banking elite. And so they did not get along personally. And then there's these underlying uh, tensions and a lot of miscalculation. So um, mistakes that were made um, on both sides. So... <clears throat> when, okay, now in terms of economic philosophy, and some of this is relevant even to our economy today, uh, the two schools of thought, those who favor what was called soft money, soft money meaning there was more flexibility, no, more liquidity, uh, is what we would call it today, uh, in the markets by banks being able to print money. Uh, this is able to to pump more money into the economy, which could be used uh, for economic activity, people buying and purchasing um, things. The, and that's a good thing. The, the downside of it, or the worry is, that that paper money may lose value. So if you print so much of it, you know what is the value of that? You're exchanging something of value, a good or product or service, for a piece of paper, and is that paper worth what what you're giving in exchange for that. And so um, this was always the concern of inflation and the value of money and printing uh, printing money to create soft, soft, soft uh, currency. Those who favored hard currency um, favored species. And when we say specie, I don't want you to think, you know, like species of animal. Specie means um, precious metals, mostly gold and silver. And so that um, either use, using gold and silver coins, which are still very much in circulation in the 19th century, or if you did print money, that the money had to be backed up by a certain amount of gold or silver, so that in theory, you could redeem that paper money for its base value. So if it says $20, you can go someplace and you can give that $20 bill uh, to a bank, and they would give you $20 in gold um, in exchange. So in theory, uh, the paper was supposed to be backed up by a certain amount of, of, of gold. Students sometimes ask about, well, do we keep gold in Fort Knox and what is, what is our money based on today? Um, the United States hasn't 
been on the gold standard uh, since uh, the presidency of Richard Nixon. So now it's kind of a floating in God we trust. Um, and now we, you know, are past paper in the age of digital currency. So again, you know, what is the money based on? Uh, is this um, a sound economy? Um, certainly no one is advocating that we go back to gold and silver coins because there isn't enough gold and silver in existence to support the amount of economic activity that takes place today around the world. So uh, it is a kind of a concept. But this was the issue that was at stake uh, in the 1830s. And as I said, Andrew Jackson was very suspicious of these banks. And so when the reauthorization of the bank came up, and this was a miscalculation from his opponents um, in 1832, which is an election year, and Andrew Jackson was running for re-election, they um, brought the charter for reauthorization early before it actually expired um, in an effort to make Jackson sign it. They didn't think that he would dare veto the reauthorization of the bank. And this was a miscalculation uh, in understanding Jackson's temperament um, and his, you know, his philosophy about government. And so when the reauthorization of the bank came up in 1832, um, Jackson took out his pen and he vetoed it. In fact, Jackson vetoed, I believe, more bills than all of his previous presidents combined. So he, he would use that veto pen if he didn't like legislation. And in this case, he vetoed the bank. Um, and then he wanted to remove federal deposits from the Bank of the United States and put them in what some people call pet banks or state banks, private banks, and not keep that money in uh, the Bank of the United States. Um, this drew so much opposition from his own Secretary of the Treasury that his Secretary of Treasury resigned, then he appointed another person to be Secretary of Treasury, and that person resigned. And so, um, finally, he found uh, a person by the name of Roger B. Taney, and he appointed him Secretary of the Treasury, and then Taney actually removed the funds from the bank. Later, Andrew Jackson would reward him for his loyalty by appointing him to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He'll give a very important ruling when we get to the Dred Scott decision in a few, few weeks, but you know there's connection there between Roger B. Taney and this and this bank crisis, um, <clears throat> and so Andrew Jackson considered this one of his greatest victories. Uh, he said, "I destroyed the bank." He called it a monster. The bank was trying to kill me, but instead I killed the bank, and um, <clears throat> that was uh, <clears throat> what he considered one of his um, biggest accomplishments of of his presidency. Before we leave this question of banks, I'm recording this video <clears throat> in 2020 when the country is going through an epidemic <clears throat> of the coronavirus um, and it has um, plunged the country already into a recession and Congress is trying to prevent it from becoming a great depression authorizing trillions of dollars in spending and to stabilize the economy and to help businesses and to help people who have lost their jobs uh, during this recession. And using the Federal Reserve Bank, um, lowering interest rates, guaranteeing um, loans to businesses and also uh, to buying up treasury notes, bonds backed by the United States government. And so uh, I make this reference today so that we can understand what would we do today if we didn't have a Federal Reserve Bank. Um, Andrew Jackson destroyed the bank um, in 1832. <clears throat> that will lead to a panic, as we'll see, economic panic or recession in those days. And then in the early part of the 20th century, the United States will create a bank again called the Federal Reserve Bank. So that's kind of like, you know, how this story uh, works out. The opposition party, as I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture, came to be known as the Whig Party, in opposition to the Democratic Party. 
They were less concerned about <clears throat> uh, the gap between the rich and the poor. Uh, the Democratic Party has always claimed to be the party of the masses, the party of the poor people. In contrast, the Democratic Party <clears throat> um, was always suspicious of bankers, <clears throat> of liberal capitalism. They strongly supported the removal of Indians. <clears throat> they were very much in favor of states' rights, and these became the positions of the time. I should emphasize that these are not stagnant. Um, positions that the Democratic Party took in one decade could change to the next decade, and the relative positions of the parties today don't necessarily bear any correlation to what they stood for at, under other presidents at other times. But in the 1830s, these were the relative positions of the Whig and Democratic parties at the time. Uh, as you can see, <clears throat> uh, Andrew Jackson would win easily in 1832 for a second term, um, getting 76% of the electoral vote. Closer in the popular vote, just over 54% of the popular vote, but as you can see from the electoral map on the screen, um, broad support uh, throughout the country. Um, and he was a dominant, dominant figure. Finally, uh, the destruction of the bank, <clears throat> as well as um, reckless land speculation, led to what was called the economic panic of 1837. Credit was not available. The value of land plummeted. Unemployment skyrocketed. And what was called the panic of 1837 is what we would call today an economic recession. An economic recession. Um, that's what is meant by the panic, of an economic uh, panic. Um, we call it today, we call a panic today a recession. And if it's really severe, it lasts a very long time, it could be called an economic depression. This panic of 1837 lasted for seven years with very high unemployment. We don't have exact figures the way we do today, but it affected large parts of the country and, um, and caused an economic recession. So uh, that concludes uh, Andrew Jackson, uh, a president who is a bridge between the colonial period of the Founding Fathers and the modern period of presidential politics. One of the first presidents to be photographed, this is an actual photograph of Andrew Jackson, not merely a, a painting or portrait of him. So he both metaphorically and literally carries us into the modern period of American politics. So this concludes my uh, lecture summary illustration of the period known as Andrew Jackson. I hope you found it helpful and useful. Most importantly, I hope that you're enjoying the course and I want you to remain focused and diligent. I'm very much looking forward to what you have to say about these issues in our weekly discussion and you can expect Andrew Jackson to be a big part of your next exam. Take care and be well.